Um, for those of you who are new or first time, my name is Randy Mayu, and I will do the book synopsis in just a moment. And normally, Reverend Gerald Britt, who is the vice president in charge of I always forget, actually. What is his title? Vice President of External Affairs. Okay. Anyway, Gerald Britt is on vacation, and um, we've got a full room, but not an overflowing room, because we've got some regulars on vacation. But welcome to all of you. Um, so let me, let me say just a word or two, and then I'm going to do something kind of extra, and I'm getting rid of all the apps open so my pocket won't get hot. Um, <laughs> And, and, uh, and I'm going to do a little something extra, and then we'll get into the synopsis. We have done this event, I think, for 13 to 14 years. I, I really don't know how long it's been going on. Um, I do another event on business books that started, and I know when it started, April of 1998. And I do two business books a month. I used to have a colleague, and he unfortunately has suffered a stroke. And then I take the same approach. Uh, here, and I, I read a book and I say, these are the critical elements of this book. So that's what I do. Now, I've got a bias. And the bias is, a book is better than a blog post or an article. Uh, it's better even than an interview or a TED talk. Now, the best thing would be for you to read the book. But, um, I already know that there are book readers who do read a lot of books, and then there are people who say, I'm going to read that book someday, and they never get to it. Right. So I don't do a review. I do a synopsis so that you can talk intelligently about the book, even though you haven't read it. So that's the plan of what I do. Uh, in a few minutes, I'm going to tell you that this book is, was particularly difficult to do with my normal approach. All right. Uh, and by the way, thanks to Ashley. Everybody give Ashley a hand. She's the one that makes sure this thing happens. And, uh, and we got it, uh, got food and water and, and all of that. And Ashley does a great job. Okay, I'm going to take a moment. And I'm going to tell one story with one very strong line. The day was September 4, 1957. It was at Little Rock Central High School, and these are what they call the Little Rock Nine. There were nine African American students who were the first ones to integrate that school on this day, September 4, 1957. Last year, my wife and I went to the high school and did their tour. It's still a, a very functioning high school, an enormous building. The book, uh, the, the, the photograph, this is Elizabeth Eckford, one of the Little Rock Nine, African-American student. And this is Hazel. So Elizabeth and Hazel. And Hazel was one of the ones who was walking behind Elizabeth, and there were parents and students screaming at the black students. Here's another photograph from a different angle. But the hatred in the face and the ugliness in the mouth was just profound. One of the things that the white people were yelling to Elizabeth and the other black people was, go back to Africa. <laughs> so I just wanted to say in this volatile week that there's a history to that concept. And, and I don't want to turn today into a discussion of that event that's happened this week. But I wanted us to know the history. We could tell you the same kinds of things were yelled at Ruby Bridges in New Orleans. But, but it was very specific. Dwight Eisenhower called out the military to protect these nine high school students who simply wanted to go learn. 
Uh, about seven years ago, I presented the synopsis of the book Elizabeth and Hazel, Two Women of Little Rock, and they kind of reconciled and became friends, and then they split again. And, and basically, the white woman never quite understood fully what she and the other white people had done to the African Americans. So um, if any of you want to read about that journey of those two women written by a very fine writer, it's, the book is called Elizabeth and Hazel. But what I want you to remember today is the ugliness of this photograph and the statement, go back to Africa. It's rather obvious that the African Americans who came to this country did not get on a luxury cruise line and come on their own. Okay, uh, y'all take 60 seconds and talk about this, and we'll begin the synopsis. Everybody talk. <laughs> Of wrath, 
where the women, and this is the way it's described, The Grapes of Wrath was written in 1939 by Steinbeck, the women knew that if their men gave up, it was over. So, so that's kind of the premise, and so here are the three quotes from The Grapes of Wrath. And the women came out of the houses to stand beside their men to feel whether this time the men would break. The women knew it was all right, and the watching children knew it was all right. Women and children knew deep in themselves that no misfortune was too great to bear if their men were whole. Where will we go, the women asked. We don't know. We don't know. And the women went quickly, quietly back into the houses and herded the children ahead of them. They knew that a man so hurt and so perplexed may turn in anger even on people he loves. They left the men alone to figure and to wonder in the dust. And so what we got in the grace of wrath is we have a, a setting where the men's livelihood is disappearing in front of them. The tractors are coming, the farmland is desolate, they've got real trouble, and as the women watch the men give up hope, and that's my phrase there, give up hope, they knew that things were in trouble. By the time you get to Heartland, which is written in 2018, but tells the story of kind of 30 years ago, she was born in 1980, the author, and, and it goes back before that, what you have is really a story told from the perspective of women, of the woman author, and she is the fifth generation of women, and she is the first of the women that did not get pregnant as a teenager. And there are plenty of stories in the book about the men, and I'm gonna use my language, who when life wasn't going well, they got violent, they got drunk, they got unreliable. And so um, this is really partly the story of women who understood that they could not rely on the men and they became utterly dependent on self-reliance. Now that's again my take and, and we got all sorts of problems. Um, most of the time, I read books by authors that I can't relate to. I've never been black, I've never been Jewish, and I've never been a woman. And so, so I want you to know that I, I am a white male talking about the experience of black people and Jewish people and women. Uh, I wish somebody would write a book about white men that I could talk about. Uh, the fact is, there has been plenty. There has been plenty. And so, so, um, I never talk about this, but maybe this is a good time for me to talk about what I feel I am obligated to do in my job. I'm obligated to do two things. Number one, to be faithful to the message of the author. I want to make sure that what I say, if the author was sitting here, they would say, okay, you left out some stuff I would have included, but you got it right. And, and so I want to do justice to this remarkable book. And, and I know that I won't do full justice. The other thing that I feel obligated to do is to not waste your time. You have given an investment of time and you want to leave here more literate, more informed, more knowledgeable, and ready to go to your next piece of work as a human being. And that's what this event is all about. And so uh, I feel a little burden in this book because I'm not sure that I'm going to get it all right. Um, it's a memoir told by a very well, a, a, a very accomplished author and speaker. And by the way, I did listen to three interviews or short presentations by Sarah Smarsh, and she's as sharp as they come. She is as sharp as they come. I turn to the back for a minute, and I printed out a big print version, so it's probably the inside, yeah, the back page. And so, we're going to start with the quote from the book, In the Box. People on welfare were presumed lazy, and for us there was no more hurtful word. 
Within that framework, financially comfortable liberals may rest assured that their fortunes result from personal merit, while gener generously insisting they be taxed to help the need. Impoverished people, then, must do one of two things. Concede personal failure and vote for the party more inclined to assist them or vote for the other party whose rhetoric conveys hope that the labor of their lives is what will compensate them. Um, this book is a memoir and a story where she occasionally inserts policy observations and political observations. But it's not a book of policy and political observations. It's a book of story. And, and so, again, that's my dilemma on what to cover. Um, this book is pretty much written to an audience of one that is not a living human being. She, who was the first of this group of five who did not get pregnant, imagined an imaginary daughter named August. Or, getting ahead of myself, August. So August or August. And this book was a finalist for the National Book Award 2018. Now, one of the things, and that's significant in the book world, one of the things that was really interesting is, even though I could tell you the name of the men, and especially Arnie, the non-bloodline but beloved grandfather, um, the names really are the women. And here are the women. You've got Betty, the grandmother, who was 34 when she became a grandmother. 34. My youngest son became a father for the second time at 34. Get ready for this. I became a father for the second time at 34. And so I can tell you other weird things that that son and I have done at the same time in our life, and we didn't realize it when we did it. That's just kind of amazing. So you got Betty, the grandmother, Jeannie, the mother, Sarah, the author, born in 1980, and August, the imaginary daughter. So those are kind of the four primary characters in the book. And, and it's interesting, she frequently called her mother by her name, Jeannie, but she would refer to her father as dad, which, which was just interesting to me. All right, um, let's go now to the front page. Why is this book worth our time? Well, first, and I don't often say this in this room. Some, some of the books I've presented in this room, don't tell the authors I said this, you ought to be really glad I read it for you. Uh, they're, they're boring textbookish type of books at times. Uh, I won't name any names. But this book is a terrific read. I mean, it is absolutely worth reading. It is a book that you want to read. So for those of you who read books at all, if you read fiction, or if you read nonfiction, you will equally like this book. So that's number one. Number two, this personal inventive memoir is an empathy builder. Circle that phrase. You cannot, you, you, if, if you finish this book and you haven't developed a touch more empathy, um, well, you need a heart surgery on you. <laughs> you know, th this, is, this is an empathy builder. Uh, let me pause a minute. Uh, in the business world, remember I do 22 years of business books, uh, uh, currently a big theme is that the best leaders are leaders who have empathy. And it turns out, how do you build empathy in a non-empathetic person? And one of the best ways is read more novels. That is one of the recommendations to people who are empathetic not not developing enough empathy. They should read more novels. Well, this reads like a novel. This is an empathy builder. Number three, this is, book is an, an emotional tutorial on class and a lesson on surviving, circle this phrase, multi-generational poverty. 
instability, and adversity. And, and it really is important to understand the multi-generational aspect of that. Uh, for a long time, people have observed, social observers have observed, that, that there's a big difference between a person who is a multi-generational college graduate and a first-time college graduate. That there are some real gaps that have to be filled in over the long haul. And in this case, she was the first. She went off and got schooling and became an accomplished writer. And, and, but she's very clear in this book. And, and I want to say two things about this. She says, do not assume that the people that I grew up with were not smart, able to multitask, able to be very skilled, and able to use their heads well. They were accomplished. They were not able to get out, and, and that's my term, to get out of that life. They were not able to get out of that life, but they were accomplished within that life. And what could they have done had they gotten out? That's kind of one of the feels of the book. Uh, the other thing is, and, and this is Randy Mayu's assumption, is she goes out of her way to say, this is a book about poor white people raised in a farm community and she says and she's right there are more poor white people in America than poor black people but she goes out of the way to say but the percentage of black people who are poor is higher and so she's talking about her experience but she's not anywhere implying that her experience was tougher than or more unfair than the African-American poverty experience. So it's not a matter of competing, it's just that she's telling this story. Okay, um, I, I normally do it differently, but if you'll look at the, and mine is big print, if you look at, when you see Dear August, and then when you go all the way to quote number 10, a penny and a purse, when they're bold with a number in front of them, those are chapter headings. And so what I've done is I've decided, if you have if you ever been to a, a, hear an author speak and they don't necessarily talk about their book, they do a reading from the book. You ever heard that? I'm kind of doing a reading of my key highlights from this book. I do that always, but I'm doing more of it today. So here we go. Number two, this is to August, the imaginary baby. Eventually, in my mind, you took the form of a baby that I either would or wouldn't have. Instead, I thought, what would I tell my daughter to do? I've never been pregnant, but I became a mother very young to myself, to my little brother, to my own young mother even. And that required digging very deep. Uh, there's a photograph in my kitchen. It is a little girl in the fifth grade who is washing dishes. And I mean, it's an actual photograph, and, and, and the sink is overflowing. And the little girl is my wife. And her dad became very ill, and, and her mother had to go to work, and they had, I don't know, 18 or 20 kids. <laughs> Not really, but it was a house full. It was, I think, six. I have to stop and add them. And she became a mother. My wife became a mother when she was in the fifth grade. And, and I read this passage and I immediately thought, that's my wife. That's my wife. I mean, she cooked dinner. She washed the dishes. She took over the household. My wife did when she was in the fifth grade. So um, that's what Sarah Smarsh was doing. All right? Um, Quote number, and I'm not going to read all of these, so when you see one in a box or one in bold, that's kind of my version of the more important ones. Um, number seven, how can you talk about the poor child without addressing the country that let her be so? And so that's one of her side issues. Uh, again, I'm, <coughs> I'm trying to think of how to do this without, you know, how do I choose which stories to tell? There's a great story in the book, uh, later in the book, where her grandmother is running the courthouse. She's running the courthouse. And, and she's the, the assistant to the judge 
who smoked cigars, and so the grandmother would sneak cigarettes. And basically, Sarah Smarsh, as a girl, would become the unofficial secretary of the grandmother who was actually running the courthouse. And, and she ended up writing as a little girl, as a girl, uh, kind of summaries of, of legal arguments made in the courtroom. And, and it was really remarkable. Uh, there are stories in the book about how she would go down, you're stealing a chair. Okay. We're not using it. Um, you see, that's why we're wearing new security. <laughs> So anyway, um, uh, there's a story of how she would love to, to go down the, the farm roads with the windows open and she could smell the farm. And, and, and I may or may not remember to read the quote about how you could smell the storms coming. And so, so you get the feel in her language and in her storytelling of what it was like to live on the farm. And, and there's a story about a fire that destroyed part of the, 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 the pole barn. I don't even know what a pole barn is, but a pole barn. And it destroyed the, the equipment inside the barn, which is almost one of these stories from Grapes of Wrath about the man losing their ability to work at the moment. Uh, there's a story about the dad nearly dying of chemical poisoning. And, and lots of stories about how they live too far from the doctor, they, they couldn't get to the hospital. She had had three rats in a school bus by the time she was finishing like fourth or fifth grade. I mean, it, it, what a capture of the farm life in that point. Okay, um, I gotta move more rapidly. Uh, I'm gonna read just a bunch of these. Number 14, fabric stores and public libraries would be in short supply on the Kansas prairie. Uh, number 18, being born female and poor were the marks against my claim on respect in the world's eyes, and I must have sensed it. That was really a good line. So being born female and poor. And then, number 19, once I learned what August means, August, it was quite a few more years before I knew how to pronounce it. Like so much of my vocabulary, I learned it alone with a book, but did, hear, did not hear it spoken aloud. Uh, if any of you ever said a word incorrectly that you had read, uh, I can tell you a really embarrassing story when I mispronounced badly the word panacea in an important setting. Uh, I said it the way it looked, and it's not the way it's pronounced. So anyway, I got, I got that one. All right? Um, when I, number 21, when I found your name, August, this imaginary dog, in my early childhood, I don't think I'd ever heard the term white working class. The experience it describes contains both racial privilege and economic disadvantage, which can exist simultaneously. And that's a good line. Put a star beside that. So racial privilege, but economic disadvantage. Number 23, if a person could go to work every day and still not be able to pay the bills and the reason wasn't racism, what less articulated problem was afoot? This is also a book about the working poor. And, and one of the first books I did in this series years ago was a book called The Working Poor by uh, Pulitzer Prize winning author David Shipler. And it is a profound book. And it's about so many people in America who work very hard, two jobs, three jobs, and they are poor. They are poor. And, and he says, that should be immoral. And it should be. Number 25. The defining feeling of my childhood was that of being told there wasn't a problem when I knew, that, knew damn well there was. I started to wake up to the gulf between my origins and the seats of American power when I left home at 18. Something about my family was peculiar and willfully ignored in the modern story of our country. My best attempt at explaining it was I grew up on a farm. 
But it was much more than that. It was income, culture, access, language, work, education, food, the stuff of life itself. Number 26. Betty, the grandmother, was 16 when she got pregnant with Jeannie, the mother. If I had to pick a fact of our family history that most shaped my relationship to you, the imaginary daughter, it would probably be that one. Every woman who helped raise me on my mom's side of the family had been a teenage mother who brought a baby into a dangerous place. Uh, number 34. She has a great short section about the very famous Jimmy Carter speech. A couple of you were too young to know this story, so Google the phrase Jimmy Carter Malay's speech. And so, look at number 34. Jimmy Carter said, and so, but we've discovered that owning things and consuming things does not satisfy our longing for meaning. That's what Jimmy Carter said. That's where he was wrong. The country had not discovered those truths, not in the slightest, that America couldn't hear his message about worshiping the false idol of wealth is a public fact that would be felt privately for decades to come. No one would feel it more than the poor. Number 42. She says, and this is interesting. Um, let me pause here a minute. Is there anybody in this room who has an actual deficiency in how you function in life? I mean, like you, you make a mistake and a deficiency that lingers. Anybody in here do that? Anybody who's not raising your hand, you're not being true. <laughs> yeah. We all do. And yet, these poor farmers would not dare admit they were poor. So that's an interesting Reminder. So look at number 42. That we can live on a patch of Kansas dirt with a tub of Crisco lard and a $1 rebate coupon and an envelope on the kitchen counter and call ourselves middle class was at once a triumph of contentedness and a sad, sad comment on our country's lack of awareness about its own economic structure. Class didn't exist in a democracy like ours as far as most Americans were concerned, at least not as a destiny or as an excuse. You got what you worked for, we believe. There was some truth to that, but it was not the whole truth. All right? Um, I'm, I'm wishing I had more time. Um, I do, I do want to mention, look at number 46. Now, 45 and 46. Mom had a knack for making it appear that we had more money than we did. Number 46. Her attention to cleanliness might have been defensive as well to avoid giving credence to ideas that people like us might be dirty. It's clean, would be Grandma Betty's first report after approving a new burger joint or a roadside motel. It's clean. <laughs> Number 51, the poverty I felt most then was a scarcity of the heart, a near constant state of longing for the mother right in front of me, yet out of reach. Uh, you've heard many stories of men who could not say to a child, I love you, and could not be close and embracing to a child. Her dad brushed her hair and absolutely praised her. She would have given her left arm if her mother had held her tight and said, I love you. The mother was aloof and could not bring herself to do that. That's a recurring theme in this book. Number 56, we would be able to map our lives against the destruction of the working class, the demise of the family farm, the dismantling of public health care, the defunding of public schools, wages so stagnant that full-time workers could no longer pay the bills. And there's a gripping section where the dad begins tallying up the money as the price of the corn crops falls and he just sees the money dissipating. And so, uh, really sad. Number 62, the American dream has a price tag on it. The cost changes on where you're born and to whom, circle the phrase, and to whom. 
with what color skin and with how much money in your parents' bank account. The poorer you are, the higher the price. You can pay an entire life in labor, it turns out, and have nothing to show for it, less than nothing even. Death, injury, abject need. No matter who you are or what you started with, though, your fortunes are not assured. Okay, number 70. The person who drives a garbage truck may himself be viewed as trash. Go back and read about Dr. King's last two days of his life, speaking on behalf of garbage collectors in Memphis. The worst danger is not the job itself, but the devaluing of those who do it. A society that considers your body dispensable will inflict a violence upon you. Um, quick story. People talk about raising the retirement age for, security, uh, for Social Security. That's okay with me. I work by reading. But imagine a man and, and, and a woman, either of them, uh, but, but I picture in my mind a man who gets on the floor every day of his life for eight hours a day and slams his knee into the wall laying carpet. That is a man who needs to retire at an earlier age. And so, a society that considers your body dispensable will inflict a violence upon you. Working in a field is one thing. Being less misled by a corporation about the safety of carcinogenic, carcinogenic pesticide is another. Hammering on a, a roof is one thing. Not being able to afford a doctor when you fall off it is another. Waiting tables is one thing. Working for an employer whose sexual harassment you can't afford to fight and risk a night's worth of tips is another. That's a good parable. That's a good parable. Um, number 75, I think it was talking about her grandmother in this instance. Her eyes were tired. They would stay tired for a long time. I think it was the grandmother. Okay, um, I, I'm, I'm about out of time. Uh, look at number 93. I'm skipping a bunch of them that I would like to read. 93. But I didn't know the half of Sugary diets that led to cavities. Noxious glue in the walls of cheap houses. Nitrates from farm runoff in our drinking water, insecticides on the wind that shimmered down from crop dusting airplanes like daytime comets. I could feel it in my body. I had frequent headaches. My heart beat drumming against my skull. When I grew up and made a different environment for myself, the headaches stopped. In Combs, Texas, outside of Harlingen, there is a piece of land that is one of the toxic cleanup sites for Texas. On that piece of land, a man and two of his sons would stand in vats and mix chemicals that were toxic, that landed in the ground, and it is a toxic cleanup site to this day. That was the Herman S. Mayu company. That was my stepdad and two of my brothers. They did it to keep going. Okay. Um, quote number, number 114. In the United States, the shaming of the poor is a unique form of bigotry and that it's not necessarily about who or what you are, your skin color, the gender you're attracted to, having a womb. Rather, it's about what your actions have failed to accomplish. Financial success without capitalism, within capitalism, and the related implications about your worth in a supposed meritocracy. Number 118, but the source of the shame I felt was not my own sin. It was our national disdain for anyone in financial need, which is spelled out in the laws of this country. All right. Um, number 127. This was interesting. Maybe due to the civil rights and women's movements, attitudes toward poor women improved some in the 1970s, Welfare raids on women's homes ended. Richard Nixon 
counted it as a point of pride that federal funds for food assistance tripled during his pregnancy, presidency. That's amazing. But shortly after that, Ronald Reagan became president and talked about welfare queens and everything changed. All right, uh, number 129, society's contempt for the poor becomes the poor person's contempt for herself. For this reason, in many cases, no one loathed the concept of handouts more than the people who needed them. And then number 144, and I'm nearly through. My life has been a bridge between two places, the working poor and higher economic classes, the city and the country, college-educated co-workers and disenfranchised loved ones, a somewhat conservative upbringing and a liberal adulthood. Well, those are my readings of the book. Let me end on the last page with my five lessons and takeaways. Number one, we are who we are always partly because of where we came from. That is a reality. Number two, and by the way, the smallest thing will trigger a memory from back then. <laughs> Number two, what our people were, our people were, is part of us forever. I had relatives who believed that black people should be slaves because of the curse of Cain. And I am ashamed and embarrassed by that in my background. But that's how I grew up. Number three, yes, there are poor white people in this country, many actually. Number four, it takes a little luck and a lot of resolve and a gift. This woman had a gift for seeing and writing and, 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 and communicating. It takes a little luck and a lot of resolve and a gift or two to make it out, meaning free. And number five, you read this book and you realize policy really matters. Well, that's my synopsis of the book, and I know that if you've read it, you would have done other things with it, so I hope I did okay for you. But I end with this. This is not all that long. The author wrote an earlier article before this book came out called Poor Teeth. Find that article. I told you how. Here's a quote from it. Find that article and read it. And oh my goodness, do you understand something about the reality of poverty? Well, that's it. Heartland, a memoir of working hard and being broke in the richest country on earth. Hope you found this useful. Thank you.